So today, we are talking about cold weather and the Inuit. Our main question, I mean, how have humans in general and the Inuit in particular adapted to life in cold environments, specifically Arctic environments? In this class today, we're just going to talk about the Arctic and not the Antarctic, the South Pole. Why? Because nothing lives at the South Pole, really. Did you guys notice that in the textbook? What is the largest permanent inhabitant, the largest animal organism that lives at the South Pole? You got it. It's a fly, yeah. A tiny little fly that sort of looks like a black speck on the ice, you know. Uh, so for us, as anthropologists, not a lot going on in the Antarctic. The Arctic, on the other hand, is a fascinating place. So today we're going to learn about cold weather environments what the Arctic ecosystem presents with us hey, as challenges, specifically the sort of classic matter energy information problem. We're going to talk about human physiological responses to the cold. This is so fascinating. Oh, one of my favorites. Uh, the Inuit specifically, as a people, and particularly we're talking today about the Canadian Inuit, um, Although, geographically, this is pretty broad. You can talk about the Greenland Inuit and the Alaskan Inuit. So you've got three different countries between the States and Denmark and Canada. And then lastly, we'll end with a bit of a discussion. Let's begin with cold environments. So the Arctic. How old is it? How did it get there? As it turns out, and remember this from last week, Domenical tells us, the environments that we find on the Earth today, we can't take for granted. They, they haven't always been the way that they appear to us right now. And the Arctic is one example of this. Sure, it's very, very far away. It seems as though it ought to be quite cold. But this is an environment that's changed a ton over the years. Basically, mid to late Pleistocene period is where the Arctic starts to emerge as a unique ecosystem. Most of the plants and animals, the flora and fauna, that we find in the Arctic today came there from the Rocky Mountains and from the highlands of Asia. Right? So there was this sort of northward migratory process of seeds, animals, right? and that historically huge swings in the climate here. Obviously, ice ages are very cruel to the Arctic, right? But then between ice ages, we have what are known as these interstadial periods that can be very warm, actually and in which the uh, vegetation, and then by extension the animal life in the Arctic, change very dramatically. In terms of people in the Arctic, that's an interesting one, fascinating one. The genetic data, if we test actual mitochondrial DNA especially, is the most common way of doing this, suggests early Arctic populations, the earliest people that we have record of having arrived there, might have arrived there, uh, let's say, 5,000 years ago. But that they arrived there in a different migration from native North Americans and South Americans and from the current Inuit. So there was some sort of founder population that arrived in this area maybe 5,000 years ago. They're sometimes known as the pre-Inuit people the pre-Eskimos, these are crummy names, but we'll talk about those later. They arrived and were supplanted, essentially, died off, and were supplanted, you know, first by a wave of people that, again, we think came over a land bridge from Russia, started to populate all of North and South America, and became the Aboriginal Americans that we know today, and then a later wave appear to be today's Inuit. We'll talk about the details of this in the second half of the class. So we have this really interesting heritage of who has lived here and how they've managed these environments, how they've succeeded or not succeeded, and why. So what does the Arctic environment do to us in terms of stresses? Remember, we talked about this uh, week one. Okay? The Arctic environment presents us with a handful of very specific stresses. As ecologists, the thing that stands out to us, it's an energy problem, right? The Arctic is an energy problem. We have prolonged low temperatures. Low temperatures are a problem for human bodies uh, for a variety of reasons that I'll discuss in a minute. We also have low biological productivity. 
What does that mean? It's hard to grow things. <laughs> Stuff grows slowly. People and animals alike. There's not much turnover in the soil, right? You don't have these nice cycles of plants growing, dying, decomposing, fertilizing the soil, and then regrowing and so on. For things to grow in the Arctic takes ages. The growth cycles are slowed right down. Right? And when they do grow, they're going to be smaller than in warmer environments. And then lastly, yeah, the first time that I moved to Edmonton, I really struggled with the light and dark. In summer, like the sun stays up until 11 o'clock at night. And I would get invited to dinner and stuff and keep missing dinner because it didn't feel at all like it was dinner time. It felt like it was four in the afternoon or something. And then you realize, oh, it's half past 10 and I miss dinner again. You know, you're not even hungry. People in Edmonton have to put tinfoil over their windows in the children's bedrooms so that they can go to sleep. Because you're trying to put your kid to sleep at seven o'clock at night. There's still five hours of daylight left. Right? Shocking. So light and dark is funny and kooky, and when you move to the north, it takes you some time to adjust to it. It also has very serious ramifications for our mental health, for our physical health, and so on. So we'll talk about that in the second half. Big picture, if we could sum up the Arctic ecosystem in two sort of problems, it's that number one, there's low energy, and number two, there's low variety. Right? So that low biological productivity means stuff takes a long time to grow and that only very few things can grow there. Right? So if this one particular type of lichen or something isn't going to grow on this rock, nothing else is. There aren't a lot of other plants that are waiting to take its place. Right? We would say that because of these two factors, the Arctic ecosystem is a fragile one. Now this is important we're not saying that the individuals in the ecosystem are fragile. It's normally just the opposite, right? Polar bears are really tough, right? And well insulated and Arctic seals and things. Right? But as an ecosystem, very fragile. So because of the low biological productivity, I want you to do a thought experiment. If you got in a big four-wheel drive truck and you drove it across the Arctic tundra and you left some big deep tire tracks in the dirt, what does low biological productivity mean? It means that it's going to take years for those tire tracks to disappear. Right? For them to refill with organic matter and then get overgrown by grass or by moss or something. Right? Because the environment turns over very slowly. Because it doesn't have a ton of variety. It doesn't have a ton of options available to solve these biological problems. Not hard to imagine why these have impacts for human beings either. Okay, the last point to mention is that in contrast to the land, the water in the Arctic, super rich. Pound for ounce, the Arctic Ocean is the richest in terms of biological or organic matter in the water of all of the world's oceans. So we have high, high rates of runoff from the tundra that gets spilled into the water. And when you imagine the kinds of animals that live in the water in the Arctic, uh, just think of what comes to mind, right? Whales, <laughs> seals, sea lions and walruses, polar bears, right? Fishing. Does anybody here ever go fishing? Hey, yeah, so if you catch sort of a foot-long trout in Lake Ontario, you're like, result, right? And my cousins, who come, I have some Inuit cousins who come from the Arctic, and they're, they sort of like chuckle at that because they go fishing in the Arctic and they land char that are sort of this big and they could feed a family of 12 and they're full of all this healthy oil and delicious meat because the water is incredibly rich. So you have this interesting paradox of essentially an Arctic desert on the surface and then underneath the water, super rich environment that supports a lot of life. Let's talk about human responses to the cold. We've got our, a handle on the environment itself. Now let's talk about what happens to people in the cold. These soldiers are fighting in the Korean War. When was the Korean War? Early 1950s. Yeah, very beginning of the 1950s. So, an anthropologist by the name of Boyce Rensberger got interested in human responses to the cold years ago, and he started sort of combing through the data on cold injuries during the war. So frostbite especially, right? And you can imagine, soldiers get frostbite. Korea is far enough north, these snowy winters, right? 
And if you're out marching around or you're hiding in a foxhole or something, you might get frostbitten hands or frostbitten feet. It's common enough that you could have a good pile of data on it, okay, and soldiers are all registered and you've got their names and numbers and their medical records and stuff. And he found out black soldiers were substantially more likely than white soldiers to suffer from cold weather injuries during the Korean War. How much more likely? Four times more likely. So this suggests that there's something biological going on, right, to the biologist. Now, as I put on my anthropologist's hat, I'm also thinking some other things. I'm thinking 1951 in the United States, this is sort of pre-Martin Luther King, right? This is not necessarily a great time to be a black man in the United States. Now, in the army, we sort of strive for equality and these sorts of things, but is there a chance that when they were handing out equipment, you know, the older pair of boots or the rattier pair of gloves was given to the black soldier instead of the white one? Do we think there's a chance? I mean, it's possible. When people are volunteering for missions or something, or getting selected for missions, is there a chance that the riskier one or the colder one, the more exposed one, would be given to a black soldier instead of a white soldier? I think there's a chance. So, certainly I think we have the beginnings of a biological problem here, and we will talk about that for the rest of this class. But I can't help but think like an anthropologist here and wonder if there aren't also some historical, cultural, political factors at play too, during war, right? And then if I imagine how I would try to solve this problem, if I wanted to do research on this problem, how would I do that? I'm a young white guy and I want to go and try to talk to black war veterans who are now 80 years old or something, right? older, and ask them, boy, did you experience racism while you were in the army? Because I've heard it was, it was a real problem, gosh. Not a lot of soldiers are going to want to speak ill of their comrades, right? No, we all got along fine, right? Those were, those were good days. Right? They might not feel comfortable talking to somebody who's generations younger than them, Right? It comes from a different background. I've never been in the army, so I can't relate right, to what they went through. So you run up against the limits of how we could solve some of these problems. Maybe you could interview their children and ask them, hey, did your father ever talk about his experiences in Korea or something? But we start to run up against the limits of anthropological explanations to these problems, and I think it gets fascinating. These are the kinds of problems that you guys are going to have to solve as ecological anthropologists. Now, we took this question a step further, Mr. Rensberger did, and he went to another place where we had lots of good data about soldiers. And that was Norway. The Scandinavian countries are notorious for gathering fantastic data. Sweden is every statistician's dream. They've been gathering data on everybody for centuries. Norway fought in the Second World War. Eventually, they were occupied by the Germans and sort of began at the south and retreated north and then went into exile. But they had a standing army. Norway, of course, very, very cold country, right? On the western side of, of Scandinavia. And when they repeat this study and they start looking at cold weather injuries among Norwegian soldiers in World War II, and this is, this is very interesting, they found that brown-haired soldiers were more likely to get frostbite than blonde-haired soldiers. Wow. So brunettes are more likely to get frostbite than blondies in the Norwegian army. Look, in a way, this short circuits some of our political argument. Do we think that the Norwegian army is sort of racist against uh, brown-haired soldiers? I, I don't know. I assume not. We also have plenty of sample size. There are lots of blonde-haired people in Norway. Right? So we're not just comparing one person with five others. We'd have thousands and thousands of, of observations in this data set. Something's happening here, right? <laughs> there is some sort of hereditary aspect, it seems, to how we respond to the cold. We will try to clarify that now. So first things first. Here's what happens to human bodies in the cold. We are endotherms, human beings are. In the old days, we used to say warm-blooded and cold-blooded. Is that familiar to you guys? Or humans are warm-blooded animals. Hey, look, in, in the scientific world, we don't really use warm-blooded anymore. It's 
kind of ambiguous, it's not super helpful. We would instead call ourselves endotherms. Our heat comes from inside. Those of you who are physics students or chemistry students, don't get tripped up by endothermic and exothermic reactions, right? Some of you are nodding. Good. If you've never heard of those things, super, then don't worry about it. This is another one of these cases where we have two different sets of definitions for things. When we say endotherms, we mean that humans create their own energy from the inside. That means we need to heat ourselves up. Sure, we warm up when we're lying in the sun, but ultimately we have an internal thermoregulatory apparatus. That is, we regulate our temperature from the inside out. Our thermoregulatory system is pretty sophisticated. It's pretty good. We can operate in a pretty wide range of temperatures, but if our core temperature gets to 33 degrees, then the system fails. It enters you know, a positive feedback spiral. Right? And if the core temperature gets to 25 degrees, we die. This is Celsius, by the way, 25 Celsius. So with the core at about 25, you're dead or dying. It's an energy problem. Human metabolic systems need energy to work, right? Anybody ever tried to use their cell phone in the wintertime? Like when it's really cold out and the screen is kind of sluggish? Or like if you have a digital watch, you know, and the numbers seem to be ticking sort of slowly? The battery slows down in the cold. It transports energy less efficiently. This is the human body's problem, right? We're chemical machines, essentially, right? With an electric motor on our heart and... Yeah, we do a little chemical process with our food to produce energy. And this is what happens. Energy shortage, the system first starts to fail, and then at 25, shuts down. All right? So we have a few ways of dealing with that. Trying to anticipate some of those problems, prevent them, or at least mitigate the worst consequences of them. One of the first and most common ones is called vasoconstriction. Vasoconstriction, for those of you who don't speak Latin, no one? Uh, literally, the constriction of the vessels. Which vessels? Blood vessels, yeah. So this is fascinating. I mean, if you imagine one of your blood vessels is just like a pipeline, right? When you get really cold, your body has the ability to actually shrink your blood vessels, just to tighten down, to narrow the pipe. Why does it want to do that? Absolutely, to reduce the chance that you're going to lose heat through the surface of your skin. Because when your blood vessels are running near the surface of your skin and they've got blood moving through them, that blood is nice and warm, right? We use our blood to keep us warm and to deliver nutrients like oxygen, to remove wastes like carbon dioxide. And if that blood vessel is near the surface of your skin, then it is radiating heat outward. If we were thinking physics and thermodynamics, what your body is literally trying to do as an endotherm is to warm up not just itself, but the entire universe. <laughs> right? It is radiating heat out and trying to heat this room up to body temperature. It's a really inefficient way to do it. So your body realizes, look, this is a losing battle. It's very, very cold outside, and I'm losing too much heat through these blood vessels. I will pull them back, right? make them a little smaller, and shrink away from the surface so that we're spending less energy on the shell and more energy on the core. Good? All right. The next thing you do is you shiver. Of course, we all know this one. Shivering's interesting. I'm not a big fan of it. <laughs> For several reasons. Like, it's temporary, and it can raise your production of heat. And it can raise it up to three times above normal, which is nice. But it's not a major overall long-term contributor to your body heat. It can't do a ton for your core. That's temporary. Number two, as a solution to a practical problem, shivering is kind of crummy, because how could you get work done when you're shivering? Right? Imagine trying to thread a needle. Imagine trying to hunt for a moose or something. Look down the scope of a rifle when you're shivering. It interferes with your work. Right? So it's an interruption. It's temporary. It's a stopgap. If you really want to warm up, you need other problems, or other solutions sorry, to that problem. Important thing to remember about shivering, babies can't shiver. And that's important for this reason and the next one. 
So what else can your body do? If shivering is not a sustainable answer, if it's not a long-term answer, what else can you do? You can raise your base metabolic rate. This is the human body equivalent of just throwing more logs onto the fire. Your base metabolic rate, rate is units over time, right? That's your rate of speed or your rate of change. Where anytime we talk about a rate, we're talking about a unit of something over time. Your base metabolic rate is your body's rate of consuming energy. We all have a resting metabolic rate. Does anybody know roughly what the adult, let's say, calorie per day metabolic rate is? Well, we see these like on food labels, right? The nutrition labels on the back of a bag of chips or something. So it's part of an adult diet. We would say that let's say women would average 2,000 calories a day and men something like 2,500. Does that sound familiar? Yeah, yeah, those are sort of good thumbnails. Until it gets really cold out, right? One of the ways that your body responds to the cold is by turning up the furnace, burning more calories. I mean, remember, we burn calories. <laughs> Think about that for a second. We set fire to them in our bellies and in our cells. Right? We metabolize them. So that produces heat. The metabolism of food and even of oxygen are thermogenetic. They produce heat. So if you can do more of that, then good. You're going to stay warmer. We would call this non-shivering thermogenesis. Thermogenesis, for those of you who don't speak Latin, uh, thermo, uh, temperature, right? Heat. And then genesis, the creation, yeah. Creating heat. We have shivering ways of creating heat, and we have non-shivering ways of creating heat. The non-shivering way for us as adults primarily is to increase our base metabolic rate. It's good for a few reasons. It warms you from the core instead of from the shell, right? If you imagine your arms shivering, they're out here. They're far away from your heart, far away from your lungs, from your gut, right? But when you can crank up the furnace, that's the middle of your body getting warmer. That's good. It's warming your central body mass and then circulating that outward instead. That's more efficient. Babies can do this too. Right? Babies can't shiver, but they can increase their non-shivering thermogenesis, their base metabolic rate. And it turns out babies can do it a lot. As an adult, you can increase your base metabolic rate in the cold by something like 25%. As a baby, you can do it by something like 170%. I know one or two of you have children. I'm sure a lot of you are aunts and uncles or babysitters or something. You see this sometimes. You pick up a child and they're just scorching hot, right? There are these little machines of thermogenesis. It's amazing. <laughs> the final entry in the list, brown fat. Mm. We talked about this at the beginning of the course, I think. We think that there's some genetic basis to some of this. It turns out that the Inuit are able to raise their base metabolic rate way higher than the rest of us. And I suspect that that's adaptive and not an adjustment Moran doesn't necessarily agree, so he and I are going to debate that one later. But brown fat is another one of these fascinating phenomena. It's a type of adipose tissue. Adipose tissue, just fat cells, right? Fat's a super efficient storehouse of energy. Brown fat is extra special fat. It literally looks different. It's darker in color, so we call it brown fat. Brown fat has the ability to generate heat. It is thermogenetic. So brown fat is another sort of non-shivering non thermogenetic phenomenon. Babies have lots of brown fat on their bodies. Big pads of it in the torso, which is just where you'd want it, right? So that it warms up your core. Just as brown fat sits there, it ticks over, right? It's always consuming, 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 cranking up the cellular metabolism so that there's lots of energy getting put out. This makes babies warm. As we age, we lose our brown fat. However, we're now discovering that some populations, especially those in the Arctic, have what we would call brown fat persistence, and that is that they keep brown fat in their bodies 
through adulthood. Fascinating. So you've essentially always got a nice little warming furnace burning away in your torso. So, a few other phenomena, human bodies in the cold, these get very, very interesting. I'm so fond of these. So this is Bergman's rule. Carl Bergman's a German biologist. He came up with this rule in 1847. People had known about it for some time before that and suspected it, but he put it down on paper. What are we looking at on this slide? This is a map of Sweden. This map shows us Sweden, and these are the latitudes, beginning with 57 degrees, which is fairly far north, even at the bottom of Sweden. It's, it's a ways up. And then going all the way up to the Arctic at, at sort of 66. Along this axis, this is the average body mass index of moose. Hunters go out and they kill a moose, and what they find is that the further north they go, the bigger the moose get. Kill a moose outside of Stockholm, he might weigh, what's this, 190 kilograms? Or sorry, this isn't BMI, this is body mass in kilograms. If you kill a moose up here at 66 degrees north, holy cow, 230 kilograms, way bigger. So Bergman's rule, as illustrated by this graph, generally applies to mammals, sometimes to birds. There's some controversy about that. But basically to endotherms, warm-blooded animals, that for a given species or a given population, organisms of greater mass are found at higher latitudes or colder environments. All right? So for a given species or a given population, organisms of greater mass, higher mass, are found at higher latitudes or in colder environments. Now, notice that I don't say larger, but I say more massive. That's important. It's not just about bigger. This is a subtle difference, but I'm going to explain why in a second. All right? When we looked at uh, last week the reading that Domenical gave us on climate, right, on, on rapid climate changes in, in paleo history and archaic environments, one of the things he said was that people have to adapt, organisms have to adapt very fast to changing environments. This puts a big selective pressure on them. It turns out Bergman's rule works even in the archaeological record, in the, the paleolithic record. So if we go to an environment where we know that, let's say, an ice age happened, even for the same latitude, same spot, you can see across generations organisms changing in size depending on the ambient temperature. So awesome. So remember, more massive, not just bigger. Why? What's the difference? Well, <laughs> that difference is explained to us by Allen's rule. <coughs> Thank you, Joel Allen, American zoologist who came up with his rule in uh, 1877. Similar, but slightly different from Bergman's rule. Anybody here like math? One person, God, two people. Tolerate math. Uh, at geometry, though, does, does anyone like geometry? That's different. Yeah, yeah, all right. This is sort of geometry 101, and it was actually our friend Galileo who got us started on this idea the relationship between surface area and mass, which, as it turns out, is mathematically knowable. We can create formulas to understand this. And it has implications for us as ecological anthropologists. So, Alan notices that in endothermic species, so again, we're talking about generally warm-blooded mammals here, like us, that in endothermic species, the appendages of those in cold climates tend to be shorter than in animals of the same species from warmer climates. So just like with Bergman's rule, we can talk about a population of animals or a species of animals, and as you get colder and colder, the appendages get smaller and smaller. Why is that? 
The hint is on the board. Yes? To retain heat. Exactly. So, these two cubes, right, they have the same volume. Well, one's a cube and one's, let's say, a rectangle. Prism. They have the same volume, but one has a lot more surface area than the other. The long and lean one has more surface area for the same volume. We talked about vasoconstriction. Why do we vasoconstrict? So that we don't radiate too much heat, right? If you covered the surface area of both of these shapes with blood vessels that were radiating heat, which one would radiate more heat? The tall, skinny one. Exactly. Which would mean it would get colder, it would have to eat more, right, in order to maintain its, its uh, thermodynamic balance. Right? So the most efficient shape for a cold climate is the one that puts the most amount of volume in the least amount of surface area. It exposes the least amount to the cold. Sound good? So when we combine that with Allen's rule and Bergman's rule together, we should expect in the coldest climates at the highest latitudes, short appendages, lots of mass, very little surface area. Right? Yes? Exactly. Yeah, because as endotherms, as human beings, uh, the, the comment was this just means less work, right? As endotherms, all of our heat's got to come from in here. If you want to be warmer, you've got to go find something to eat. And if you're trying to find something to eat in the Arctic, that's a lot of work, right? So if you can turn down the amount of heat that you radiate, that means you keep more for yourself, right? You warm more efficiently, and you don't need as many calories. Good balance, yes. Yeah, this was a good, uh, does vasoconstriction make the blood pump faster? What do we think? There are some health studies people in the room. If the human body is a closed system, right, and you have a fixed amount of blood sort of pumping through your body, if the blood vessel itself gets narrower, blood pressure goes up. Okay, if you want an example of these two things in action, here's a photo of me and my wife. I don't think she'll mind. This is if you're struggling to understand the Allens and Bergmans. My wife is from Northern Ontario. I am from Southern Ontario. She's five foot zero. Lots of mass. She used to be a gymnast, you know. She's very muscular, right? Uh, I am long and lanky. I do not have small appendages. Remember, we're not just talking about legs and arms. Nose and ears also apply. And frankly, one of us has big ears and one of us does not, right? Pick the organism that comes from the higher latitude, very easy to spot. She's a biologist, so I tease her about this quite often. She understands. Alternatively, you could just consider rabbits, <laughs> if you wish. Please, yeah, and please don't anyone take my relationship advice. It's <laughs> terrible. Which one of these comes from a cold climate? Okay. Yeah. So when we say appendages, we don't just mean long, skinny arms and legs long skinny fingers, we can mean tails, absolutely. We can certainly mean ears. I mean, look at the massive ears on this guy, right? And if we just go back and think about our shapes for a second, and you look at the ears on that guy, think about how much heat is getting radiated out of those ears. Total non-starter in a cold environment, right? They would freeze off in seconds, right? Super long ears, right? More pronounced pointy face, Right, as opposed to a flatter face, longer, narrower limbs, right, more exposed, body lies flat against the ground. Right? So we have some differences in shape that are associated with latitude or with temperature. Okay? A few other little things. This last one, the hunting reaction. Uncle Phelps. I I'm trying for you guys, I really am, but it's... <laughs> It's a tough crowd. Uh, okay, the hunting reaction, also sometimes called the Lewis reaction. As you might imagine, it's named after someone whose last name was... Uh, Thomas Lewis describes this in 1930. This is an experiment that all of you can do at home, and it's actually quite interesting. I hope at least some of you try this in the name of science. Uh, the hunting reaction is a cycle, an alternating cycle of vaso 
dilation and vasoconstriction. So if vasoconstriction is blood vessels shrinking down, what's vasodilation? It's the opposite, right. When our pupils dilate, they open up, right? And so similarly, our blood vessels have that ability. They're plastic enough that they can both constrict and expand. And it turns out that if you expose an extremity to cold, in, in other words, if you stick your hand in some cold water, what do you think happens first? Vasoconstriction happens, yes. The body gets worried about exposing too much of its blood vessels to this cold, losing too much heat, so it starts to constrict the blood vessels. After something like five minutes, ten minutes, the opposite happens. Whoosh, the blood vessels open right up. You get a perfusion of blood, and that period lasts for five or ten minutes, and then whoosh, the blood vessels constrict again. Why do you suppose we call this the hunting reaction? I mean, imagine that you're out in cold weather and you're hunting. Do you need your hands to work? You do. You do. Now, this is a tricky reaction. It turns out that it's trainable. So let, let's try and answer that. It's trainable, which means you can improve your hunting reaction. You can make it happen faster and more powerfully. People that are total experts the, the sort of world champs at the hunting reaction are actually uh, cold weather fishermen. When you go to the United States, to the East Coast, or to the Maritimes, my dad used to be a fisherman in Halifax, and you have to stand on the you know, deck of a boat all day with no gloves on, you know, pulling fish out of nets or tying knots and stuff. You get chilly hands, right? Your body learns to accommodate this by putting itself through hunting reactions. First, vasodilating, pulling the blood vessels away to limit heat loss, and then whoosh, perfusing them with blood, vasodilating so that they warm up again. Remember, vasoconstriction can't happen forever. What happens if you don't get any blood to those fingers? Yeah, you get frostbite. Has anyone ever had frostbite? I have. And I did it while I was doing anthropological research. So you're welcome, everybody. <laughs> right. So vasoconstriction can't go on forever. And if your body starts to sense that this is the kind of thing that you're doing very often, you're going fishing every single day, you can train your body to become better at doing the hunting reaction. Fascinating. Now, is that what we would call an acclimatory adjustment? I mean, I think so, right? This is an adult change as a result of the plasticity of our bodies that can happen later in our lives, and it's reversible. If you stop fishing tomorrow, maybe your hunting reaction returns to normal. And yet, we find that black Americans have substantially slower hunting reactions than white Americans, even if they've spent you know, exactly the same amount of time outside in their lives, fishing in their lives. Not everybody has a great hunting reaction. Not everybody does this every time. But at least when we do these studies in the United States, we find that of all the people that walk through the laboratory, the ones with the weakest hunting reaction are black Americans. What's going on there? Fascinating. Our bodies are starting to tell us something about how human responses to the cold work, and I think it's exciting times, because we're still far from understanding all of this, which is great opportunities for you guys. Super good. The exact purpose of the hunting reaction, we talked about what's its role. Obviously, we call it the hunting reaction because we imagine people tramping around in the cold, trying to shoot a bow and arrow, or trying to fish with chilly hands. It's not clear that it works super effectively that way. Hunting reaction doesn't seem to improve your grip strength, but it might, let's say, preserve uh, your fingers and prevent you from getting frostbite. Right. Yeah, good question. So this is not an exercise response. This is not about flexing your muscles and experiencing more vasodilation as a result. Because that also happens, right? We can warm ourselves up just by moving if you jog on the spot, right? Feeding more blood to working muscles. No, you can actually do the hunting reaction at home with a bowl of cold water. Stand there perfectly still and dangle your hand in it with a stopwatch and see how long it takes. Uh, now, we're going to start talking about the Inuit by me showing you a video. Has anybody heard of Wade Davis? Yeah, anthropologist from Canada, actually, and he sort of made his name when he was a graduate student by going to Haiti and studying the phenomena of, of voodoo possession, zombieism, essentially. He's the anthropologist who wrote the book on zombies, really, and ever since, yeah, he's been famous for that. Uh, very interesting guy, and he now sort of travels around the world as an explorer in residence, 
for National Geographic, which is one of the world's best job titles, I think. Um, visiting you know, uh, Aboriginal peoples and tribal societies all over the world, learning about how they live. He tells this story about some time that he spent in the Arctic. He calls this story the shit knife story. If anybody's heard it, you know, you can stop me here. I'm sorry if that language is a little coarse. Uh, fascinating stuff. We're going to start with this. He comes to us with the idea that the Inuit were considered savages, right? They lived far away and they had this very primitive way of life. They didn't live in nice houses like we did and have the technology that we did. And his argument is that we got it exactly wrong, right? That precisely the opposite is true. That surviving in an environment like that, these are actually the most exquisitely adapted people on Earth, right? And that with nothing, literally nothing at all, they can what? They create a sled, right? disappear in the middle of the night, and run off to their freedom. This is mind-blowing, right? The ingenuity, right? The cleverness, the toughness. So now we're going to talk about the Inuit of Canada as a people and some of their regulatory adjustments to life in extremely cold climates. So when we talk about the Inuit, that's plural. This is the name collectively for the Arctic peoples, some of the Arctic peoples of northern Canada. Singular is Inuk. I-N-U-K, so if you meet one, you've met an Inuk, and if you've met five, you've met some Inuit. In terms of brief histories, we think of the Inuit today as having maybe arrived something like a thousand years ago. Prior to this, the peoples that lived in the area were known as the Dorsets, D-O-R-S-E-T. Dorset culture dates back from a thousand, way back to even five thousand years ago. And before the Dorset, there were more people that lived in this area. We know them as the pre-Inuit, or the Paleo-Eskimos. These are clunky names, but obviously we have very little remaining from pre-Inuit culture. Dorset culture, we do actually, you know, archaeologists go up to the north and uncover stuff. It's very interesting. But uh, of the pre-Inuit, very little is known. There is some oral tradition among the Inuit. They tell legends of the people that lived here before looking very different from us. They're very big and tall, very muscular, right? And we are all very short and very round. This is fascinating for those of us that are interested in genetics. So, generally, today, when we speak of the Inuit, uh, we make the sort of ecological distinction between coastal and inland peoples. This reminds me a lot uh, of an anthropologist that we learned about in the last class. Coastal versus inland, why? Because they have very different methods of subsistence, right? Fishing peoples, shoreline foraging peoples versus open tundra hunting peoples, right? Somewhat fixed versus semi-nomadic. This sounds a lot like an anthropologist who said you can learn all about a people by learning about their subsistence model, right? Who was that guy? He worked in California, right? Hung out with the Shoshone Indians. His name was Julian Stewart. Ah. Oh. Guys, we're so close. Julian Stewart's big is sort of contribution to uh, ecological anthropology was watch the subsistence. That's going to tell you what you need to know about people. So this is kind of a Stewart-esque division of uh, of the population, right? Coastal peoples and inland peoples have different subsistence methods, and we think that tells us what we need to know about them. And as we've said, you know, interesting genetically, today's Inuit, we believe, belong to a separate migration from today's other Aboriginal North Americans and archaic Arctic populations. So we're dealing with a very interesting group. Let's talk about some of the regulatory adjustments. Remember, humans can adjust in three ways, right? Developmental adjustments, acclimatory adjustments, and then regulatory adjustments, also known as behavior, right? Culture, acting different on account of the weather. We have a whole handful, and they're fascinating. Clothing and housing, for sure, bear special attention. And the first things that stand out for us, one of the first things as children that us down here in the South learn about the Inuit is that they wear those great big coats, right? and furry boots, and they live in igloos. Sure, yeah. And we've said, we heard from Wade Davis, that the first sort of foreigners who came into contact with this 
thought that this was primitive technology. What do igloos look like? They're a dome. They're like half a sphere, right? Think back to Galileo. Think back to Allen. Surface area for volume, what's the most efficient shape in the universe? The sphere is. Yeah. Why don't your houses have corners? Because corners are a waste. <laughs> they expose themselves to the wind, right? They radiate heat. If you're going to live in a very cold place, you want a sphere. You want a dome for your house. A properly built igloo can be heated with a single oil lamp. <laughs> right? A little wick burner in the middle of the igloo is going to keep it warm enough for people to stay inside. The inside of the igloo melts just a little bit during the daytime with lots of body heat and oil lamp heat, and then at night refreezes when the inside of the igloo is glazed with ice. Now it reflects heat as well. What shape is super efficient for reflecting heat? Spheres are. Yeah, yeah. All the geometrists in the class, what do you even call that? Geometricians? Geometers? Yeah, you could imagine drawing your heat lines, right, and doing the angles off of this. You want lots of heat to bounce back. You want to minimize your exposure to the wind. You want to maximize the amount of heat that's maintained within this shape. A half sphere is your best value by a long shot, right? Clothing, outstanding. So the Inuit have extremely sophisticated, low energy answers to clothing. You need to balance the fact that you want to stay warm with the problem of getting too warm and then starting to sweat and then soaking your clothing and then chilling down again, right? So those of you that are into sort of skiing or hiking or something, you go to mountain equipment and you spend 500 bucks on a waterproof breathable jacket that has like vents in the armpits, Inuit have been doing that for a thousand years. And they've been doing it themselves. They've been stitching those at home. So vented clothing, clothing with openings strategically placed was crucial in the sort of Inuit uh, regulatory adjustment process. So building clothing that had openings, let's say at the bottom of the legs, at the waist, on the upper body, so that you could vent selectively. Heat rises, right? So if you wanted to let off more heat from up here, you can simply open up those vents and allow some steam to escape. The outer layer of your clothing is waterproof. Right? Impermeable, windproof, right? and then the inner layers are insulative and they're faster to dry. The other thing that I want to stress, and this is important, about igloos as a form of housing, not only are they warm inside, they're humid. They maintain moisture in the air. In super cold environments, humidity plunges, right? When it's very, very cold, it's very dry, always. When it's minus 40, the sun always shines. There's no clouds in the sky when it's that cold. Right? Humidity matters because one of the knock-on effects that we saw, that Wade Davis talks about, of forcing the Inuit off the land and into government-built housing, was that the air in prefab houses in the Arctic is super dry. When you build wood-framed, sort of Scarborough-style houses and plunk them onto the tundra and put sort of a heater in the corner, they're dry as a bone inside bad for your lungs. And then suddenly what did we see huge rates of? Right? Quickly rising among Inuit communities that have been resettled into sort of stable, uh, fixed communities. Respiratory infections. Tuberculosis especially, but certainly also pneumonia, other th asthma, things like that. Right? The air is too dry. Igloos are awesome at humidifying the air. It's a house made of water, right? Of course it humidifies the air. So, don't forget that. Now, education and socialization. So when you grow up as an Inuit, or as an Inuk, I should say, kid in one of these uh, beautiful communities in the Arctic, you're indoctrinated in what we would call this. Does anyone want to take a shot at it? Tricky language, eh, this one. The Inuit education process, and I don't mean going to school in a town in Inuvik today, but I'm talking about traditionally the way that children were raised placed a massive emphasis on what we would call ecology, and really on what we do in this class. Huge emphasis on teaching children about the relationship between humans and animals. Right? About weather patterns, about migratory patterns of animals, about the dangers of overhunting or overfishing, right? the best times. 
So a keen, keen awareness of the environment around you. This makes sense. Inuk, you know, uh, this kid who's an Inuk is going to grow up in a dangerous environment, right? Harsh weather, thin ice, big animals around. So developing a real keen awareness of your environment and your place in your environment keeps you alive, right? In terms of social values, in terms of things that really get promoted through this type of education system, toughness is certainly one of them, physical toughness. The idea that when you're chilly, you don't moan about it, you persevere, right? It's a good thing to be tough. That you stay alert. This looks like attention deficit disorder to us, you know, and it can be disturbing, but frequently, Inuit peoples are trained or are raised in the ability to pay attention to, to several things at once. Why is that? Because you live in a harsh environment. You need always to know if a blizzard is about to come. If you're pursuing this animal, you need to know if there's another one behind you who's pursuing you, right? You need always to be looking at the ice under your feet to make sure that it's going to support your weight or your sled, right? the health of your dogs. So, a constant awareness of the environment around you. It's easy to be sort of uh, blasé about the environment when you live in these really rich ecosystems that are nice and safe, in the middle of a grassland. You can see the predator coming from five miles away if you live in Saskatchewan, right? You're not super worried about the bear that's kind of like jogging 10 miles away toward you. You've got time to work out a plan. Right? In the high Arctic, you need constantly to be aware. So alertness is like a real social value, and it's trained into people from a young age. Generosity and partnership, super important. So the idea of sharing what you have, if you go out hunting and you're successful, you bring in a seal or something, your first instinct is not actually to cut it up and dive in, but to cut it up and pass it around, to share. This is interesting. We'll talk a little bit more about the sharing phenomenon in a second. In terms of kinship, in terms of family structures in Inuit society, very interesting. Super flexible compared to a lot of other societies in the ethnographic record. Some of you might know, even in your own families or your own lives, uh, your parents might have strict preferences for who you should marry, right? Someone from this class, someone from this neighborhood. <laughs> In some cultures, it's, it's, uh, cousins are the best spouses. Why would you want to marry a cousin? Except for that they're super hot. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. To keep the money in the family. To consolidate your power. If you marry somebody totally new, then you're going to have to cut your fields in half and give your new in-laws half of them or something like that. Give them some of your wealth. If you marry somebody who's in your slightly extended family, the family stays rich, right? We see the exact opposite. Almost everything about Inuit family structure seems designed to keep extending the networks wider and wider and wider. So you can marry whoever you want. And in fact, it's frowned upon to marry somebody who's near to you, right? By blood or by geography. The idea is you want to actually stretch out. Go down the road, go outside of the cousins, and cousin marriage is actually sort of frowned upon in Inuit culture for this reason because it's too close. You should push out, right? Adoption is actually historically is a long tradition of adoption. If we're putting on our Darwinian hats, we would think this, this seems odd, right? Why would you want to invest all kinds of energy in raising someone else's kid in a tough environment? Why adopt a child? Remember, what is the driving force in Inuit kinship structures? It's extending that network. So why would you want to adopt a child? To pull another person's kid into your own family and raise it. And now the family from whom you adopted that child, who live 100 miles away, now they owe you one. Right? And now you've got a connection to them, right? You're raising their daughter, their son. And then when you see them at a festival five years later or something, you can say, by the way, could I ask you something? <laughs> right? So you're extending the kinship network. And then lastly, networks of sharing. We talked about generosity. Meat sharing, in particular, is very important. As an Inuit child, when you're born, you get a list of meat sharing partners. 
You get a roster of names. These are the people who, when you go hunting, you're going to have to divvy up with them. Choosing your meat-sharing partners is actually very important. You don't want to choose people who live nearby, and you don't want to choose people who are related to you. Why not? It's right there. Yes. Because you're trying to draw more people in from further away. This means that if the hunting goes bad where you live, you could be confident that you could pack up your sled and you and your family could move 100 miles across, you know, to the east, to the west, to the north or south, and that you could find people there who you knew, who you could count on, right? Who you were, they were your allies. So the mission is always, always to try to reach out. When we describe it this way, this sounds like the grooviest society in the world, right? People are generous, they're friendly, they're easygoing, always trying to make friends. Sounds kind of nice, right? You sort of wonder why the early explorers were so hard on these guys. Those of you who are cultural anthropologists might have heard of Marcel Mauss. Anyone? Okay, great. So Marcel Mauss, ethnographer who wrote a very famous book called The Gift. His main argument in The Gift in a single sentence was, people don't give presents to each other to be nice. You don't really care that it's your friend's birthday. You don't care about your friend. The reason that you give that gift is to create a relationship, right? A network. You give gifts to pay back a debt or to create a new debt, to open up an obligation between two people, right? To cement a relationship, to earn yourself some good karma or a spot in heaven or something, right? That gift giving is a way of two people making a bond. That's how to understand gift giving. Marcel Mauss, he ends up being a kind of handy guy for understanding some of this exchange behavior, right? With the Inuit. If you consider that you've spent the whole day hunting and you're tired and you've just got this beautiful fresh seal in front of you and all you want to do is eat the entire liver, so delicious, right? So good for you. But you say, no, you know what? The better thing to do is actually to cut this into, you know, five and I'll have a fifth of it and I'll give the other four fifths to, to my partners, to my meat-sharing friends. I will extend this network further outward and I'll make sure that the next time they have good luck hunting, that I'm on the receiving end, right? Okay. And then lastly, cultural values. One of the really striking ones comes from a book that an anthropologist named Briggs wrote in the 1970s, or in 1970. She went and lived among the Inuit, uh, among uh, a very isolated, still very traditional subsistence-based community. And one of her most striking events happened when she got angry. She'd been hanging out in the field for some time and something had happened that really pissed her off and so she lost her temper. And what happened when she lost her temper was that the people around her treated her like a child. Like, like, a, like an infant. And this to her as an anthropologist was this fascinating moment. I've discovered something, she said. And then she started looking out for what, what would happen when other people in this community got angry. And what she found is that they never did. The expression of anger is almost totally forbidden, right? You live in very cold, very dark environment. People get squirrely. It happens here. In Scar I mean, you guys notice that. By February, people get weird, hey, and squirrely and tetchy and stuff, I find. So you need to have social mechanisms in place that moderate that. Make sure that people don't strangle each other when you, know, you have 24 hours of darkness across these long winters. When the hunting's going bad. When you're inside an igloo with the same four people that you've been in an igloo with for the past three months. Right? You're going crazy. So anger, totally not acceptable. When something goes wrong, the Inuit response is not to shout, not to get mad, it's to laugh. All right. To defuse the situation, right? Keep those networks happy. Try to maintain a social harmony, right? I, I mean, who doesn't want to live up north? Sounds fantastic, right? Yes. So is anger seen as a childish trait? Exactly. Yeah, anger is seen as a childish trait, and that was what fostered the response from the people around her. Was that the only reason that she's being angry is because she's uh, an underdeveloped child who just doesn't know any better? Right? And we see that in our own society with children who shout during movies or who do inappropriate things in restaurants. And we say, well, 
That's a foolish thing to do, but because you're a kid, we'll let you get away with that. But as an adult, you'd know much better than to never do that in a restaurant, right? The attitude was the same toward the anthropologist's anger. Don't you know, getting angry is not the dumb thing. That's not how we respond to our problems. I see that with my own sister. She has a bunch of little kids, four of them. And you know, when a four-year-old is freaking out and yelling and you say to them, hey, use your words. It's not okay to hit, right? Don't shout. You have to tell me what you want. This is the exact same approach to adult anger. Fascinating, all right? Okay. A few more regulatory adjustments. They go on and on. Some of these are, are so fascinating. The question of diet. What do people eat up there? They, they sure eat seal. Yeah, that's a treat. A lot of fruit and veg? No. What percentage of your diet is carbohydrate, do you suppose? Quite a bit. Majority? More than half? For most of you, probably two-thirds of your diet is carbohydrate, let's say. Yeah, if it's, if it's 40 or 50 percent, then you're, you're making some concerted effort to avoid carbohydrates. What percentage of the Inuit diet is carbohydrate? Like one, two, three, maybe. Yeah. In season, you know, if you find some berries or something, absolutely, those can supplement the diet. But the rest of the time, basically all of your nutrition is coming from fish and from meat, from blood, from those animals, right? Animal products, right? Tons and tons and tons of protein, tons and tons and tons of fat, and lots and lots and lots of calories. We said earlier, average adult male sitting here in Scarborough might turn over how many calories a day? 2,500. Inuit male, hunting season, how many a day? 5,000. If any of you study fitness, nutrition, biology, you'll know 5,000 is a, a shocking amount of calories. If you tried to eat that many in a day, you would be hard pressed. You're just plowing down meals between meals. I mean, if you imagine that I'm managing about 2,500 a day by having breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and a couple snacks, I would literally need to have two breakfasts, two lunches, two dinners, and then four snacks, right? In order to double my total daily intake. So, a hugely calorie-rich diet, but very, very healthy people. Cholesterol, nice and low, as a matter of fact. Macronutrient, that is protein, carbon, fat, and micronutrient, that is vitamins and minerals, levels are great. These people get their vitamin C from fresh meat. Remember, humans are apex consumers. We're at the top of that trophic chain, which means we get our vitamin C from the fish or from the animal that ate some vitamin C for us. That animal went out and had to do all the hard work of digesting some moss or something, and we just get to go ahead and eat the animal, right? Fresh meat will give you most of those, especially uncooked fresh meat, will give you most of those micronutrients. Where are they getting their carbohydrates from? This is a little tricky. Those of you that are fond of the Atkins diet and stuff, I shake my fist at you. Your brain can only metabolize sugar, right? It can only metabolize carbohydrate. And the body needs to get carbohydrate from somewhere. And if, as an Inuit, if you're eating 10 grams of carbohydrate a day, your brain needs at least 100, right? At least 100. You get your carbohydrate by synthesizing it from protein and, by, and from amino acid. So your body can actually break down protein in order to pull the sugar it wants out of it. That takes work, right? It takes chemical energy to do that. That is an exothermic reaction, produces some heat as a byproduct. Does the Inuit care? He's happy about that, right? He's trying to do everything he can to crank up that basal metabolic rate. So if it takes me some more energy to synthesize my carbohydrates, I'm actually perfectly happy. This is a win-win situation. I get the sugar I need, I get to eat more protein, and I stay warmer the whole time. Fascinating solution to this problem. Yes? So the thing is you need carbohydrates Yeah, the brain, the brain metabolizes carbohydrate as its, as its primary fuel. Yes? Not particularly. Yeah, yeah. Now other, obviously, skeletal muscle can metabolize fat, though it always does so in the presence of, of carbohydrate. I like to say... You can burn fat, but it burns with a carbohydrate flame. You still need that sugar to set fire to first. But your muscles, let's say your skeletal muscles, 
can prioritize fat in aerobic metabolism. We'll talk about this at, at much more length next week. It's so exciting. <laughs> all right. Problems, though. All is not perfect. Circadian rhythms, which are what? Yeah, the schedules of night and day and sleep. Turns out these conflict with the Inuit diet in a very interesting way. Depending on the time of day, and depending on the light and dark, your body is going to increase the amount of calcium in your urine. So when it's dark out, higher calcium content in your urine. Can you see where we're going with this? It's dark out in the north from sort of September until April, <laughs> right? Incredibly short days. And eventually, across the thick of the winter, no days at all. Just 24 hours of darkness. Which means that in winter, Inuit bodies are leaching calcium. Lots of it. They're losing calcium like crazy. And because they don't have a diet that has, let's say, leafy greens, lots of milk and cheese and butter, they're going to be calcium deficient. Simple as that. This is compounded by the fact the Inuit diet is very rich in phosphorus. Phosphorus also has the effect of accelerating that calcium leaching. Phosphorus, very, very uh, high amounts of it in, in like carbonated drinks, like Coke and Sprite, terrible for your bones, awful for your bones. Yeah. And so this ends up causing problems. If you end up extremely calcium deficient, you can end up suffering psychological side effects. We used to call this Arctic hysteria. We thought that people went mad in the wintertime because it was dark out, because they had cabin fever, right? Turns out, at least part of this, if you're the sort of person who is predisposed to anxiety, calcium deficiency will actually have psychoactive consequences psychological, behavioral consequences. Dissociative disorders, right? Mania, panic. So this is a problem with the diet. Is that a question? Yeah. What's up? So it has its high in vitamin D, but also, doesn't the vitamin D It would, but then they need to be getting some calcium. <laughs> yeah. Sadly, they don't. Yeah, yeah. Why, why don't they do a bone marrow soup or something? Yeah, exactly. So, so the diet ends up being, right, we've said vitamin D we get plenty of from fish, especially, right? Uh, wouldn't that help you synthesize calcium and absorb it? It does. Unfortunately, the diet's already so bankrupt in calcium. And number two, the rate of calcium loss is so accelerated, first of all by the darkness and second of all by phosphorus, that you're losing it faster than you can take it in. Not everybody goes crazy in the middle of wintertime, right? But it can happen. Uh, it varies. Some food is cooked and some not. Uh, in terms of health benefits, we've said that raw meat is the healthier kind, actually. That as far as an adaptive diet to the Arctic goes, raw meat's the best kind you can eat. Um, we denature some of the uh, nutrients in food when we cook it. For us living here in Toronto, it's not a problem, right? Uh, we mainly eat beef just for bulk protein. That's what we get from beef when we grill the heck out of it, right? Uh, but if you're eating raw meat uh, in the far north, then you're also getting uh, a broader variety of minerals from it, and especially vitamins, all right? Okay, a few other things. Religion, very briefly. Oof. We would say, broadly speaking, that the Inuit are animist. Animism, in other words, Investing the natural world with supernatural qualities. So the spirits uh, of animals, of mountains, right, of the water, and so on, we ascribe all of them special properties. The most important relationship in the Inuit religious system is the relationship between human beings and animals, and especially which kind of animals? Uh, the best animals to eat, yeah. So seals, other big game. Caribou in some area, right? In Scandinavia, right, we don't do caribou but uh, reindeer. Yeah. And almost invariably we find that it's the big game animals, the most, we would say, economically productive animals who are the most special. And with whom we need most carefully to manage our relationships. Okay? 
There is a tradition of shamanism. That is, people who are believed to be possessed of the ability to exercise some communication or control over the natural world. We wouldn't necessarily call them priests. It's not quite accurate. Shamanism in the Inuit religion is generally very practical. <laughs> you ask the shaman to predict the weather for you. Can you tell me if it's going to snow on Thursday? Right? Can you tell me where is going to be a good place to go fishing tomorrow? Right? And if a shaman is successful at that, then he is generally a successful shaman. Right? That's the mark of an effective shaman, is one who is well attuned to the world around him. Right, very sensitive to the environment, strong relationships to the things around. There is a huge tradition, again, I'm selling you guys well on this, of feasting and of ceremonies, especially at what time of year? Wintertime. Yeah. Why? Because winters are long and boring. The party schedule during the wintertime is jam-packed and it is awesome. Right? <laughs> huge feasts of redistribution often, right? And not just redistributing among the high class, among the most successful, but actually the opposite often. Feasts at which somebody who's had a lot of good luck hunting gives to people who are old, who are sick. Trying to balance things out. Some of these feasts also involve degrees of like sexual freedom that we sometimes find in other societies. You get a weekend off. You get a free pass, so everybody can sort of swing a little bit for a, a weekend. Again, we sort of consider this, maybe this acts as a social purge valve for people that have been cooped up in an igloo for months and months, relieves the monotony, the social tension, the ability to go out and celebrate, mix and mingle with new people, share your food, and so on. This is a way of surviving the winter on a cultural, emotional level instead of just a material one. And then lastly, this social mechanism here, infanticide and suicide, this is interesting, right? We talked about population at the beginning of the course, right, and the ways in which population gets regulated. There is a tradition of infanticide, especially female infanticide. It's not super common, it's not inevitable, but it does happen. And there are a few theories about this. One is that this is a means of managing stress. Managing exposure to demand, a cost-benefit equation, right? Having another mouth to feed could be difficult. The Inuit are not farmers, they're not herders, they don't need lots of bodies around, and maybe having too many of them would be a problem. Male children are generally preferred because they're considered better hunters than females, and so if you had too many female children, you may selectively uh, kill them. Abortion, not super commonly practiced traditionally, but sometimes. There are a few, though, interesting considerations. One is child betrothal. In other words, uh, arranged marriage of a sort. So you could, as parents, decide that you think that your daughter ought to marry that guy who lives a few communities over, even when they're four years old or something. Expands the network, right? Ties your, child, your children to somebody else's children nice and far away, and now it makes you friends. So that's good. This also serves to mitigate that infanticide stress. If you could imagine that your daughter is already taken care of. When she grows up, she's going to marry this great guy from a good family. We all love each other. So this will be super. The other thing that's important to notice, is there anyone here with blonde hair? Wow. Not really, hey? I mean, I used to have blonde hair when I was a lot younger. All right. The Inuit hunt, right? This is their subsistence model, primarily. And they hunt on the ice. Hunting on the ice is dangerous. Do we agree with that? Yes. So, at birth, in Inuit societies, there are more boys than girls, probably for this reason. In adulthood, in Inuit societies, there are generally more girls than boys, more females than males. Why? Because a lot of guys die on the ice. They fall through, they die of hypothermia, they get attacked, and so on, right? Hunting is risky in the cold. The theory about blonde hair is that it's a very recent variation of the human appearance that arose during a fairly recent European ice age. 
during ice ages, there are not very many guys around. Lots of girls, not very many guys, generally. So the theory is that blonde hair arose as a piece of sexual competition. That when Mr. Ice Age uh, hunter-gatherer goes to the nightclub, there's 36 brunettes and one blonde. And he says, hmm. Right? It's a means of standing out from the crowd. Right? This problem of the danger of hunting in the cold does have impacts, right? Population-wide. You end up needing to rebalance the gender ratio somehow. So perhaps infanticide is actually a fine-tuned population-level mechanism. It's interesting. So I'm going to breeze through this stuff very quickly. We read the article, right? The Bore article in which she talks about diet in a northern Baffin Island community. It talks about the way that, ah, oh, this diet, as it turns out, is, is fantastic for your health, right? Not only is it traditionally valuable and so on, but it's good for you. Seal meat's a real part of the local identity, and seal blood is considered to be crucial for your health. Not just the meat, but the blood itself, because it circulates in your body. It mingles with your own blood, and it keeps you strong. And that if all you eat is food from the grocery store, you're going to be weak. You're going to have pale blood. Anybody ever killed a seal? No. Very dark blood. Very, very rich. Right? Yeah, it looks nice and dark. You go to the hospital and somebody hooks you up to an IV. That IV fluid is just clear. Right? Looks thin. Doesn't look like there's any good stuff in there. Right? This is the story that one of the elders tells to Bore in the article. All right? Bore is arguing that culture is a set of solutions to practical problems. This sounds like one of our friends who wrote about cows in India. What was his name? Marvin Harris. Exactly. Culture is a solution to practical problems. Right? Why do the Inuit people like seal? Because seal is the best food to eat in the Arctic. Do you guys, are you convinced by that? Or is that just too much determinism? Does that sound like sort of too easy or scientific a way of sweeping aside what is like a serious, symbolic, religious, personal attachment to seal? Why do I like eating seal? Screw my, my calcium count. I love eating seal because when I grew up, I went out with my dad and hunted. And I have these great memories of the beautiful land up here, right? I'm happy when I'm out on the ice. Huh. What do we think? Does that explanation work? Yeah. Okay. And I think that's our system. This is a bold argument. Do we hear that? There needs to be some kind of biological motivator. Do you disagree? Well, I agree. Oh, you do agree? Oh. I was going to say, <laughs> when, I, when I read the article, there was this case of this woman who, she had like, she had like 30 something. She had oh, and she felt sick, yeah. Depression and whatever. And like, one thing that I, when I read, like, how can your diet cure depression? Right. So Right, okay. So we're putting on our sort of medicalization hat here and saying, well, what you're describing is like illness or depression. And then she went home and ate sort of a piece of seal liver, right? She was fine. And then that night, yeah, she said, I feel great, woke up the next day and she was sound as a pound. And that to you is like, you're thinking, nope, this was all in your head. You weren't genuinely sick and then cured sort of by like a piece of seal meat. Huh. What's that? A placebo effect. Interesting. In other words, if we invest enough belief into this thing and we think it'll make us feel better, then it will make us feel better. Huh. Boy, you guys are all such biologists. I was really hoping that, that a real cultural anthropologist would stand up and say, nonsense. <laughs> huh. Yes, say it. No, no, what? Oh. Sure. In order for the placebo effect to work, you have to think it's going to work, in a sense, right? Okay. Yes? I just think this also Ha! Right. Where does she get the meat? She goes on the radio, and she gets it from a neighbor. She extends the kinship network, right? So many tribal healing systems and shamanistic systems are based on the idea that being sick is not about your biology. It's about being out of step 
with what's around you. When you reintegrate, you feel better. Last one. Yep, definitely. Mm. Yep. So this is about a relationship, and not just a chemical one. This is about a symbolic, actual ritual relationship with yourself and another animal. Exciting stuff. Next week, high altitude. I'm so excited.